person really gets their needs met. And then they feel a bit bitter and disappointed because they haven't asked what they wanted. No one asked them and they depart. So, going back to um, Carnegie, he said smile. Now, the research in 2007 found that we have mirror neurons in our brain. Everyone want the long version of this? Okay. There was a researcher and he had electrodes in the monkey's brain. The research assistant went off to lunch and came back. The research assistant was licking an ice cream. And the researcher noticed that the somatosensory area of the monkey's brain lit up. What does that mean? So research assistant licking an ice cream, monkey's like licking center in its brain lit up. What does that mean? He wants to do it. Yep, there's a bit of imitation. What was that? Yes. So these mirror neurons, what they do is if you attend to someone, you look at them, your mirror neurons get you to mimic slightly on an unconscious level what the person's doing. So when you smile at a patient, they can't help but feel slightly cheered up. So even if they don't give you a full-on smile back, you will improve their mood. So Goleman <coughs> done these mirror neurons. Interesting finding, people with lots of Botox. <coughs> they, <laughs> no, no, I thought it was actually interesting. As a therapist, I can't have Botox because I have to be able to look worried. If I'm <laughs> sitting there, like, the patient's thinking, she doesn't care, the patient's <laughs> <laughs> Also, if your face can't imitate their face, you can't read what's going on for them. So people with Botox give less clues out and also can't read clues. So you might need to restrict where you get your Botox. So now the other area of why smile back, the, uh, anyone want to see the clip? On this YouTube address, um, as undergraduates, we had to watch on film, now you can YouTube it. They had a baby and it was interacting with the mum. And the mum would smile, the baby would smile, the baby would coo. And then they say to the mum, stop smiling now. So the baby, when the mum doesn't smile back, it sort of tries hard off. <laughs> Still nothing. But then the baby starts to cry. And if the mum still doesn't do anything, the baby start flopping about and go quite limp. So from the age of babies to adults, if someone smiles and we don't smile back, they found that it triggers the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex in the brain. Now the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex is the center for physical pain and emotional pain. So if we don't smile back, we may as well kick them in the shins because it literally hurts. So if a patient is in emotional pain, the same pain centre lights up as if they're in physical pain. Anyone find that interesting? <laughs> when I was working in the adolescent group when I was a new graduate, a lot of the adolescents would take painkillers and I was thinking, why? Why would you do that? Because it works on the pain centre. So when you're in emotional pain, if you take painkillers, it actually decreases your pain. So not smiling back triggers a sense of rejection and causes physical pain. So, so also why smile? Now, when I was an undergraduate, we were taught there were two branches of the autonomic nervous system. Sympathetic, so flight fight, parasympathetic, so freeze, and rest and digest. They're now arguing, back to 2015, that there are three branches of the autonomic nervous system, and she nicknamed it Smart Vegas. Now, if we smile at someone, and 
they feel pleased, dopamine is released in the brain. Now, when dopamine is released, it's a pleasure chemical and it makes us feel safe. So smiling at the patient can make them feel better just because it primes the smile, but it also depends on the person's attachment history. If the person has super good relationships with people, it's like a chemical party in their head. So smiling releases dopamine. Did anyone know that? So people with addictions to sex, drug, shopping, dopamine is released in the same way as those that are well adjusted, that gets dopamine released from relationships. Okay, so looking at the picture, oh, there was a, a study by Daniel Goleman and he's found that you can only fake it so much of the time. So this study by Goleman in 2007 found that if someone's faking good, faking nice, faking friendly, when their fake smile slips, we have a suspicion network in our brain. Now, have you ever been out, and it happens to me, you know when you say, how are you, and someone says, good, thank you, <laughs> and you sort of think, I don't think so. <coughs> so, if you can't give a sincere smile, faking it's not always the answer. I might go with a warm, friendly voice rather than a pretend smile. So, can you pick by looking at the picture of which one's the re real smile and why? Okay, everyone vote right or left? Left. And what's the difference? Eyes. Yes. A real smile uses the muscles near the eyes. So that's why you hit crow's feet if you smile a lot, okay? So, and the fake smiles do not trigger a reciprocal smile because it's the smile around the eyes that trigger it. Okay, true. So, smiling triggers a feeling of calmness and connection. Now, the feeling brain is faster than the thinking brain. So, someone has formed an opinion of you based on their feelings before they've had a thought. So, how you present to a patient and how you present to people matters. So, by the time they come up with a cognitive opinion, they've already decided whether they like you or not. Once someone doesn't like you, you have to work much, much, much harder to get them to change their mind. But when they do like you, you like them even more because they've seen the error of their ways and they're now like you. So, but being mindful of how you present to a patient um, will have a big impact. On reflecting, who thinks they present well to a patient? Who thinks they're warm and friendly when they greet them? Okay. Who thinks that that's not their strength? Okay, I often have young patients say, I thought you were a real bitch when I met you. <laughs> <laughs> I came to like you after. I said, that's funny. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so, so, so if you're not a natural smiler, using a warm, friendly voice will have to be your default option. Yeah. Okay, so I thought, okay, formal conflict resolution. I went to a course in 2002. This woman had a PhD and she did um, negotiations for United Nations. So she was good at conflict resolution. So I was very excited to think the graph. I'm going to learn something useful. Now, it was a four day workshop and these were the primers. Identify the issues, identify both parties' positions, do a conflict analysis, plan the process, identify all parties, identify their interests, identify their fears. What's the problem with this in a clinical setting? Sorry, what was that? It takes too long. Exactly. Now, Libby, my sister, is a lawyer, she said, that's what I do. <laughs> I said, right. So it's too cumbersome, and I'm sure there are points that are <laughs> relevant, like identify the party's position, like find out what they want, but you can't do a conflict 
predict analysis. You can't make a plan. You have to be able to think more on your feet. So I hunted it out of my... It was still in my briefcase <coughs> in 2002, my old briefcase. So it tell, tells you a lot about how useful I thought it was. Okay. So conflict, does it need to hurt? <coughs> conflict occurs when there are uh, conflicting needs, wants and desires. And traditionally, they've been conceptualised as win-win, win-lose, lose-lose. When is it lose-lose most often? Think of an example of when it's lose-lose conflict. The patient doesn't get better. Right, yes. What about people getting divorced and getting nasty with the solicitor. No winners in that one except the solicitor, of course. So conflict resolution is not the stuff you need to say it's how you handle it that makes a difference. So if your goal is to have all parties feeling heard and respected, how might you act? And what would you need to think and do to stop being destructive? So, someone come up with an example of a typical conflict that they'll have with the patient. What's it normally over? Some examples? Why do I need an x-ray? Okay. And how do you handle that? Um, well, it's essentially explain that if you go to see a, a physician, he's hardly going to look at you across the room. You still want to take the shirt off. And, mm -hmm. Um, and okay. How does that work for you? Maybe that might be shepherd. So, in, in, in your thinking, Alex, how are you thinking about the patient? What are you thinking when you're going through the X ray debacle? What's your motivating thought? Um, I need the information to be able to give her... Yes, but what are you thinking about the patient, honestly? Um, <laughs> well, it, if it's a concern of money, yeah. so sometimes I'll say, well... What are you I actually thinking about the patient? You're bloody annoying, you're holding me up. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, yes that's right. So, with this, when I'm right, you're wrong, escalation occurs. Now, how often if someone disagrees with something that you suggest, who actually spends time asking questions about what their concerns are? Put your hands up if you take time to actually find out. And so people with their hands up, how well does it generally go when you take time to find out what your concerns are? Yeah. Yes. Work with them. Yep. Um, because how can you address the patient's concern if you actually don't ask them what they're worried about? Mm. Um, and even if it's something that you consider irrational, you still need to discuss it with them. Um, one of the things in the marital literature that they didn't talk about um, in, and it was in a subsequent book by Mm. Anyway, they, by Goldman, they turned around and said, if you're not prepared to discuss something, then things go downhill dramatically. So what do you need to think to stop things becoming destructive? If you think it's just a problem to be solved, how will you go? Better, worse. So it's just something that we need to sort out so I can understand what you're thinking so we can move forward from there. <coughs> so the what not to do, the escalation, so we go straight to annoyance, <coughs> name calling, and telling the patient they're stupid for not agreeing with you. <laughs> Or refusing to Refer discuss it with them. Uh, um, what was that, sorry? You refer them to one of the friends who don't like them. Someone that you don't like. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what about the 
active listening, we had someone give a lovely example of active listening and clarifying. Um, now, they also found in Goldman that if you actually listen to someone and they're looking at the brainwave patterns of both parties, the person listening to the person talking, if they're truly listening, their brainwaves start to mimic each other. So their state of arousal will get mimicked and then you actually have true synchrony with patients. So if you give divine attention or no attention at all, so you're taking phone calls, giving instructions to people, what's the patient going to think while they're talking to you? Yes. And another barrier to listening is mind reading. So you think you know what the patient is thinking. In our master's training, we had to be recorded when we saw patients. And I remember asking this patient something, and I thought I knew what she was going to say. When she answered, you could actually see me looking shocked as if to say, what? You thought, what? So, taking, no, it, were, if I, it was seriously a weird thought. So, but if you take the time to actually find out what they're thinking, it means you can address it with them, rather than assuming that they're tired with their money, that whatever else it is that you assume. So, ask questions, clarify the points. Am I correct in thinking you are saying X? Now, if you frame it in this tentative way, am I correct, what do they know they've got the opportunity to do? Correct. Yes. They can say, yes, you're right, no, you're not right, I'm thinking this. So, you phrase things in a tentative, respectful <coughs> manner, and then you give them the opportunity to give you feedback. So, what might stop you listening to people? What are some of the thoughts? So you've got them booked in for 30 minutes and they're talking. What are you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> Hurry up, I want to do your work. And someone said at the last one, I get bored with listening to people. <laughs> Sweet. Okay. And so thinking that you know what you're going to, uh, they're going to say. So de-escalating skills, when things start to go badly and a patient's getting distressed, the returning to the validation, if you, as we discussed, say the patient seems like you're getting upset, um, what's causing you concern, even actually this validation, they found that if you label your own emotions, like, hmm, I'm distressed, I feel upset because people paradoxically feel better. So even if you say, like, call me, I feel sad, it actually makes you feel better. So also doing the same to the patient makes them feel better. Who knew that? Um, do you want an extreme example of invalidation? That's an awful one. Yeah. It's good. No one can resist. The invalidation, they had this article in the newspaper, which I unfortunately read. This two-year-old was crying, and the mother...